Good morning, Hickory Knoll. It is a wonderful blessing to be with you today. And uh, thank you, Mr. John, for leading us in good singing. And thank you, James, for the leading us in prayer. And we'll continue to remember Rose in our daily prayers. We welcome all of our visitors and guests, and we have several with us today. We want you to know that we're very happy and honored that you're with us. Glad to see Ronald and the family here today, and glad to see that you're able to be out and about today, Ronald. We continue to pray for you, sir. You can count on that. Which brings me to what we're going to talk about for a little while today. Um, I've been asked recently, twice recently, by diff two different people to talk some about prayer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about prayer today, but this is by no means all that needs to be said or all that the Bible says about prayer. I'm also, I've also been asked to talk about faith and how you continue to be a person of faith when you can't get God to answer your prayer. And so that's the human dilemma. Let me just go ahead and give you the, the message uh, in a nutshell right now. Here we are as human beings, having been created by an all-powerful and all-knowing and all-loving and merciful God. And we want to boss him around. We want to tell him what we want him to do. And we want to tell him when we want him to do it. And it seems to be a part of the human heart to, say, to feel that if God doesn't do exactly what we want him to do, when we want him to do it, then uh, we're disappointed and we say, well, you know what? My faith is slipping away. Because I can't seem to get God to do. Hey, listen, if you'll think about it, you can't even get your spouse to do exactly what you want uh, you, uh, to do and, and when you want them to do. Or your children or your parents or the, or the government. What if you wrote a letter every day to the White House saying, this is what I want as a, as a tax-paying citizen of this country. I demand this and I want it now. And you just get silence from Washington, D.C. You would say, well, hold on. What's happening to our country? Well, nothing's happened to our country. Our country still stands, even though you can't get Washington, D.C. to do exactly what you want them to do. You can't get your kids sometimes or your parents or uh, your spouse or your company or your business or your customers to do exactly what you want them to do sometimes. So why would we think that an almighty God could be pushed around and bossed around and would be there at our beck and call anytime we decide. Hey, listen, uh, what, what if one of our children saw a shiny, interesting looking sharp knife? And, and I'm talking about a toddler now. I'm talking about a two or three year old. And, and, and so they get it and they head straight for the electrical outlet. And wanna, you know, we would say, you can't do that. You might want to do that. You may be asking for my blessing and my information or my, or my cooperation, but you, 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 you just can't get it. You can't do exactly what you want to do all the time. And I think the same thing is true with God. So imagine that you're out somewhere and you try to get in touch with someone. I mean, there is someone that you really need to get in touch with. And, you, and so you call them and it rings and it rings and it rings and it rings. No answer. No answer. That drives my wife crazy, by the way, when I don't answer the phone because she checks with me several times a day. And if I don't return her text or, or, or answer her call, right away she thinks something's wrong. You know, something's happened to me. And, of course, when the shoe is on the other foot, when I call her and she doesn't answer, I start thinking, guess what? All these things that might have gone wrong, you understand. Is she sick? Has she fallen? Is she, you know, what, what's happened to her? And then, of course, when I find out she's okay later on, but it's never soon enough, then I am so relieved. So um, have you, have you, uh, imagine being on the side of the road with a flat tire or you're out of gas and it's cold and it's raining or maybe there's a storm going on and you're calling and you're calling and you're calling and you're calling and no one is answering the phone. And you leave a voicemail and you don't get a call back. And you're thinking, what's going on? There's no answer. I feel so deserted. I feel so alone. Well, many Christians, and I guess all of us at one time or another, that's the way we feel um, about, uh, about our prayers. Because we think 
that our prayers should be answered immediately and exactly when we ask and when and for the the uh, the request that we made. Here's the Manhattan transfer. Oh, operator information, give me Jesus on the line. Operator information, I'd like to speak to a friend of mine. Oh, prayer is the number, faith is the exchange, heaven is the street, and Jesus is his name. Operator information, give me Jesus on the line. My mother used this number when I was very small, and every time she dialed it, she always got a call. Don't worry about the money. I will pay the charge. Just give me him on the line. I'm calling from my heart. Operator, information, give me Jesus on the line. Well, that makes for a cute song. And that's a toe tapper, by the way, if you don't know that song. Uh, But what the song is saying is, is that I have a direct connection to heaven. And that is true. But again, telling God exactly what we want and when we want it makes us sometimes feel forgotten. And so have you ever felt forgotten? Um, you know, we feel this way sometimes because of, of the people around us. And one of our problems is uh, preachers like me, because uh, we make it seem so easy to please God and do God's will. And sometimes we simplify it to the, to the extent that we, 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 and we get up and we say, you got to pray and you got to pray in faith and you got to pray often and you got to be persistent. And all that is true. But you say, I am praying and I am praying often. I'm praying daily. I'm being very persistent and I'm praying in faith and I'm trusting and I feel forgotten because it seems like God is either not listening or he's not cooperating with me or he's just very late in 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 sending me what I need and I've got these problems and I've got and so sometimes we look at the at preachers and then we look at other people we look at um, other Christians and they seem you know just to get along fine and it seems as if their prayers are being answered just right and left and you'll hear somebody say yeah the other day in the rain I was at the mall and I sent up a prayer to the Lord I said Lord I'd like a parking place near the door and you know what a car pulled out and I pulled right in there and it was more than it wasn't more than 20 feet from the door and I said the Lord is answering my prayer and you're hearing that and you've got troubles you maybe you got you've lost your job or your health is bad or your kids are rebellious or, they're, or they're, you're, you're, you've got all kinds of difficulties and issues and you say to that person, would you please shut up with those silly prayer requests and telling me that God is answering things like parking, please, when I can't get him to give me what I desperately need and I've got a big problem and not something silly like a, a little parking. And what about the sinner folks? You know what I mean? The, the, the folks who don't go to church. They don't honor the Lord. They don't come to worship. They're kicked back this morning. They're still in their pajamas, you know. Uh, they're sitting around and, you know, relax and kick back and scratching. Or they've gone to the golf course. Or maybe they're, they've gone to the beach. And they don't honor the Lord. They don't come and contribute. They don't pray. They just live, they just live the life. And seems, things seem to go pretty smoothly for them. And we think, what's going on here? Here I am trying to walk by faith. I'm trying to walk in the Spirit. I see other people, preachers make it sound easy. I see Christians who seem to, you know, just to be living the life and they don't seem to have, I, and then, and then non-Christians who just don't honor the Lord and they're out there. Everything seems to be going well for them. And I am feeling forgotten. So here's another song. This is Don Williams. And by the way, he is an elder in a church of christ congregation in uh, the nashville area he says lord i hope this day is good i'm feeling empty and misunderstood i should be thankful lord i know i should but lord i hope this day is good you've been the king since the dawn of time all i'm asking is a little less crime it might be hard for the devil to do but it would be easy for you lord have you forgotten me i've been praying to you faithfully i'm not saying i'm a righteous man but lord i hope you understand Lord, I hope this day is good. I'm feeling empty and misunderstood. I should be thankful, Lord. I I know I should. But, Lord, I hope this day is good. Isaiah 49, verses 14 through 16. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And then this question is asked from God through the prophet. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? 
and have no compassion on the child she has born. Though she may forget, I will not forget you, God says. I will never forget you. You will always be on my mind, and you will always be in my heart. And so when we feel forgotten, the question is, will our faith hold? Because we don't want to abandon our faith simply because we have some problems and difficulties. Uh, and and we're, we're going through a wilderness period in our life. And we know that the scripture says, Hebrews eleven six. but without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we want to please God. We want to be someone who trusts him. We want to be someone who, who uh, walks by faith. And so how do we go through the, the wilderness phase in our life and, and hold on to our faith when God seems to not be listening to us and he's not seeming to cooperate with us. Notice I'm using the word seem. He seems to be late according to our timetable, according to our watch and our calendar and, and our time scheduled. And so um, what, what's going on? And, and will faith hold? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, there are some very uh, plain things said in this verse. I'm looking first of all at verses 1 and 2. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful. And so he's saying, look at the example that Jesus set. He was faithful no matter what, even when he was mistreated. Skipping on down to verse 12 in Hebrews chapter 3. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And so right away the Bible is saying, I know sometimes you want to just turn away. I know sometimes you want to just throw in the towel. I know sometimes you you think about abandoning your faith because you're going through a tough period in life. And and it seems that God is not responding. And so he says, see to it that, that you don't do it. Verse 13. But encourage one another daily as long as it is, is called today. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. And so this this scripture is saying, don't walk away from your Savior simply because in this sinful world, you are going through a rough patch in life. Because, you know, uh, Job said this. Job said in 14, 1 and 2, man or woman who is born of woman, that's just about everybody, um, uh, is uh, that life is short and full of trouble, he says. Life is short and full of trouble. This life is not supposed to be paradise. Paradise is over on the other side. It's not to be found. This is not heaven. And therefore, we are not going to live this life as if we are in heaven. This is a different kind of existence. And so, will our faith hold? Revelation 2 and 10 says this. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Uh, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. That means for an unspecified period of time. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you your life. uh, I will give you life as your victor's crown. And so he's telling us there uh, that we we can live forever if we will be faithful. Now, here's a good a good uh, point, and that is that the Bible gives us some amazing examples. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first uh, several verses, 10 verses, he's telling us about people who abandoned their faith because they, they rebelled against God because they didn't think God was running the universe and their lives the way uh, it ought to be, the things ought to be done. And so they decided they would rebel against God. Well, they were punished as a result of that. In verse 11, the scripture says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And then he says, these are very comforting words. He says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can 
bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. In other words, God will never allow you to be put in a position where you are forced to abandon your faith. You may sometimes be uh, um, tempted. Uh, you may sometimes be at the, at the point of almost being deceived, but God will never put you in a situation where you will be forced to abandon your faith. Now, I'm going to have to hurry, but notice this. This is, um, this is a, a character in the Bible, some characters in the Bible, that are very important in the story I'm about to tell you. And um, notice, um, first of all, Herod the Great, and he was, the, he was a vicious and mean and cruel man. As a matter of fact, Caesar Augustus said this about Herod the Great. He said, um, uh, it is better to be one of Herod's swine than to be one of his sons. Why? Because, well, he, uh, he killed some of his sons. He killed a couple of his wives. He killed one of his mother-in-laws. He had five left, I think. But he, he, killed, uh, he killed several people in his own family. He was a bad, bad, bad man. And he was the man who was king when Jesus was born. And uh, when uh, in, and in Bethlehem, the babies, uh, the, the order came down from here that the babies were to be, baby boys were to be killed. So this is the man we're talking. Well, he dies, and then uh, his three sons uh, get the inheritance. And so there is, uh, uh, well, uh, Archelaus uh, gets uh, the the southern part of the kingdom, and Antipas gets the uh, uh, gets Galilee, where Jesus lived most of his life, and then Philip over here, he. Uh, he wound up just really, he just wound up rich and famous and had no responsibilities. He had nothing to, well, he had a, uh, I'm sure she was a cute wife. I'm sure she was beautiful. And her name was Herodias. Well, one day, Herod Antipas, um, he visits his brother Philip. And Philip's apparently not home or whatever, but uh, he starts talking to Herodias. And he says, Herodias, I don't know exactly how to tell you this, but I love you. And she says, well, you know what? I love you too. And so they run off together. She's got a little girl whose name is Salome. And so she becomes the queen of Galilee uh, as the wife uh, of, uh, of Herod Antipas. Well, and so these people are in power during the time in which... Um, uh, uh, Jesus is on earth or, and during his death and, and, then, uh, and then John the Baptist the same way. Now, um, here's the situation. John the Baptist, who is afraid of no one, speaks up. As a matter of fact, he would go out in public and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, John, uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, the Herods were not Jews. And so when John the Baptist said it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, he means it's not lawful according to God's law. Uh, the Romans didn't particularly care. and The Greeks didn't particularly care uh, whose wife you ran off with. But God cares. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, according to the law of Moses. And so John the Baptist is a man who is afraid of no one, even Herod. He went about preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the man who said, repent. And he baptized people uh, uh, to repentance and getting ready for the coming of the Savior. In John chapter 1, verse 29, he calls time out when he sees Jesus. And he says, now folks, he said, I appreciate, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, you folks following me and trusting me, but look at the Lamb of God because he's the one who will take away your sins and the sins of the world. So, he says, follow him. And by the way, you know that they're cousins. What would it be like to have such a famous cousin? Um, Jesus is just six months younger than John the Baptist. Have you seen that movie trailer out, um, The Identical? And it's, uh, the story is uh, loosely based upon the fact that Elvis Presley was a twin and that he was born to very poor parents in the 30s in Mississippi during the Depression, and they felt they couldn't raise both, uh, both children, and so they gave one up for adoption. And a preacher type and his family adopted the, one of the twins, and, and the other became a rock and roll superstar, while the other one became, you know, he had as much talent, he had the looks, he had it all, but he didn't get the breaks. That, well, the, John the Baptist had this very famous cousin, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. Well, John goes to prison as a result of his preaching. 
Now, you would think with a famous cousin, uh, even if he was thrown in prison, he would get bailed right out. You know what I mean? Uh, that, that, that no harm could come. He would be like Teflon. No one could do anything to harm someone as close to the Savior of the world as John the Baptist was. But, I mean, he had done everything right. He had stood for what is right. He had preached what, is, what was right. He, he had connections. I mean, but he's in trouble. Now, I'm saying this. You and I need to be reminded if someone like John the Baptist, who is that close to the Lord, even blood related to the Lord on the human side, can get into trouble, what would make us think that we won't suffer some difficulties in our life from time to time? So this is Mark 6, verse 17. And Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. And he had him bound, that means handcuffed and bound, tied up by ropes or whatever, and put in prison. Why did he do it? He did it because his wife, uh, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married, and because she was saying, get this guy off the streets. He's yelling from the street. You can hear him up in the castle, you know. Uh, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife and all. So get him out of here. Well, and it gets worse for John because his cousin won't bail him out. And so here's John in prison. Now, here's, here, here are, this would be the way that most of us as human beings think. We think God is good as long as life is good. But if my life takes a turn for the worse, then we tend to want to think, well, God has changed. He used to be good, and now he's not so good. Uh, he used to be faithful to me, and now he's not so faithful. Why? Because I'm suffering. And so when John the Baptist finds himself in prison, then his world becomes that prison cell. And all of a sudden, there are no rewards, there are no perks, there's nothing for being the cousin of Jesus. And, no, and then not only that, this is Matthew 11, verse 2 and following. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah... He heard what Jesus was doing. Jesus was out there healing people. And not only was he healing Jewish people, he was he healing people like the uh, centurion soldier's son and people like that. I mean, he was healing people right and left, and he's leaving John in prison. And so will John the Baptist's faith hold? I mean, uh, and is he beginning to say, I'm like Don Williams in the song. Lord, have you forgotten me like, the, like Zion in, in Isaiah? Uh, Lord, have you forgotten us? Uh, have you turned your back on us? Have you left us alone? Why? Because, you see, uh, uh, we, we begin to doubt when difficulties are coming our way. And so John begins to doubt. And, um, and, and doubt, of course, is a heavy burden to have to carry. I don't know if you've ever been uncertain about whether someone is, that you love is faithful to you or if your business partner is ethical and honest or, or are they embezzling from you. Or if you've ever had these kinds of doubts, you know how it feels. And some people, even John the Baptist, might even begin to doubt. And so here's John, and you know he's doubting because but we're back to Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and following. And so he says... Uh, in, uh, in verse 3, are you the one? Now, this is John the Baptist who is sending his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you really the one? I know that I, know that, um, I kicked in my mother's womb when your mother told my mother that she was expecting a child. Um, I know that I have blazed all kinds of trails for you. I know that I've announced that you are the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. I have seen you do amazing miracles, but I just want to know right now, since I can't get you to help me, are you really the one? Because I'm beginning to wonder if you're there. And so Jesus replied, verse 4, Matthew 11. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Go tell him that. And he will know that I am the one. This is proof that I am the one. And then it's almost as an afterthought. Jesus says, oh, yeah, and, and, and uh, tell, tell, him, uh, tell him one more thing. And so Jesus says 
There's one more thing that John needs to know. You see, right now, he can't see past his jail cell. You see, because pain can overshadow and overcome our faith when we're in the moment of pain. Have you ever been hurting so bad that you couldn't pray for someone else? You say, well, I pray for my friends and my loved ones all the time. Have you ever been so in such pain that all you can do is just suffer the pain and you can't even bring your heart and your mind to pray for someone john is is suffering so much pain uh, being in prison that he can't seem to be able to rejoice that jesus is out there doing all these wonderful things to the glory of god all he knows and all he can feel is his own pain and he says i need some relief I need, I, I need to be able to see past my present circumstances, but he can't. And so Jesus says this in verse 6. Blessed, and by the way, the word blessed or blessed, it's, we pronounce it two different ways, simply means blessed by God. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. This is what Jesus said. He said, go tell him that the lame walk and the deaf hear and all this. And then one more thing. Tell him blessed is anyone who who does not abandon their faith because they don't understand or agree with the way I'm handling matters. That's basically what he's saying. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble or lose their faith or abandon their faith because of me. And so somebody says, well, show me the proof. I I need to know that the Lord, even though I'm in a jail cell or I'm sick or I'm in financial distress or my family is in turmoil... Um, or I'm in a, some other kinds of, of, of uh, very uh, painful situation. I need to know, I need some proof that Jesus cares about me. Well, here's the proof. The, the cross is the proof. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider it uh, equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. So maybe our faith not, ought not be used just to our own advantage, but to be a blessing to others as well. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the, on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And so what's the proof that God cares about me? What's the proof that God remembers me what's the proof that he loves me what's the proof uh, that he is concerned about me and my eternal salvation the proof is the cross and and folks here's something that we need to remind ourselves from time to time it's not what happens to me or you that is so uh unfortunate it's what happened to christ that is the most unfortunate he had to suffer and die Because of our sins. So the next time we want to get an attitude toward God, just remember that it's our sins who put God's son on the cross. And so when there's no answer, it doesn't mean God is saying no, although it might be no. It might be yes, it may be later, it might be wait a while, it may be I have something better in mind for you. And so let me just run the universe and let me run your life and let me manage things according to my will and my way. So when there is no answer, then let's remember. Let's remember, first of all, his sacrifice. This is Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and following. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so when we don't get the answer we want as fast as we want it, just remember his sacrifice. Number two, remember yesterday's blessings. Today's problems do not remove the truth of the matter that God has taken care of us in the past and has answered our prayers in the past. And so even when things sometimes seem bad in the past, we look back on them and we realize that something good came out of something that we thought was terrible in the moment. And now we find ourselves thinking, I'm glad that whatever that bad thing was happened because if it hadn't been for that, then this good thing wouldn't happen. And then, of course, it could be worse. Um... 
My secretary reminded me of that the other day because we were planning a trip that I'm going to take uh, later on in the year, and it is an awful trip. I mean, the schedule is awful. And, I'm compl- and I said, and I will get there exhausted. And she smiled and said, well, it could be worse. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you could be sick too. No, I said, well, thank you for that attitude adjustment there. It got worse for Jesus. It got worse for, uh, for John the Baptist. Let's go back to Rome, Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. And I'm going to read from verse 19 and following. So Herodias, this is, uh, uh, this is Herod's wife who ran off, left her husband, Philip, and, 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 well, and she's got this daughter, Salome. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John the Baptist and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous man and a holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders. When the daughter of Herodias came in and and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. By this time, they're all liquored up, you understand. And the king said to the girl, ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. Well, you know, he's probably thinking, you know, if it was like today, a teenage girl, what's she going to want? Taylor Swift concert tickets or season tickets for the, or a new iPhone or something like that. He's not thinking much. And so, but she does a very surprising thing. She says, "Uh, let me ask my mom about that. And so she went out, verse 24, and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? Because he's drunk and he says, I can have anything I want. And she says, tell him you want a silver platter. And on that silver platter, you want the head of John the Baptist. Well, verse 26, the king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, you know, sometimes a peer pressure when you say something in public, you have to go ahead and and follow through. Um, He didn't want a refuser. So he immediately sent out an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. I almost said sweet mother just to to be sarcastic. On the hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body, laid it in the tomb, and then they went and told Jesus. You know what Jesus said? He said, among all those born of women, and that's all of us, there's none greater than John the Baptist. And the doubter would say, then why didn't you help him? Why didn't you rescue him? Because, I mean, here's what happened. A girl dances. Uh, Herod makes a promise. The girl asks her mother for advice on what to ask for. Uh, The mom wants John's head. And so they kill the cousin of Jesus. And Jesus didn't stop it. Well, God didn't stop the death of Jesus either. Why? Because it's necessary for us, for him to suffer in order for us to have our sins forgiven. And then it's, it's important for us to realize that suffering gives us a special relationship with Christ. Have you ever said to someone, I, and you really mean it, I know how you feel. Well, Jesus knows how you feel. Because he's felt that way and even worse. And so we identify with him when we suffer. This is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and following. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed for the spirit of glory and God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a, as a murder or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. That means don't be discouraged. Uh, but praise God uh, that you bear that name, the name of Christian. And then the last point when we suffer, and that is simply remember that our salvation is based upon the fact that God did not 
rescue Jesus. When Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 39, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. God didn't stop it. God didn't stop the torture. God didn't stop the suffering. God didn't stop the bleeding. God didn't stop the death because it was all a part of the eternal plan. Somebody has got to pay for our sins. And God says, I'm going to have to do it. And I'm going to place the punishment on my one and only precious son. And yes, I'm going to allow him to suffer so that others can be saved. And so now here we are in the 21st century, some 2,000 years from the time that Jesus suffered, and souls are still being saved. And the population of heaven continues to increase. Why? Because God didn't answer or God didn't stop the suffering, the suffering of Jesus. Well, let's remember that there is a secret to survival in our spiritual life, and that is blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone who continues to trust in the Lord even when life does not always turn out to be what would you say? A bed of roses, a bowl of cherries, or whatever you might want to say there. Why? Because the next life is perfect and it's forever. Well, and so let's always trust in the Lord and, and not be disappointed or lose our faith because of the way he leads us and the way he will save us eternally in heaven. Here's God's plan of salvation. You'll see that we're to hear the gospel of Jesus and believe it with our hearts and to repent of our sins and to confess our faith in Jesus and receive baptism for forgiveness of sin and to determine to remain faithful to him the rest of our lives. If you've done that already, but you still are having difficulty in life, you'll never find a better time than right now to ask your brothers and sisters to pray with you and for you to help you get through this wilderness period in your life. And remember, never, ever, ever let any of us stumble because the Lord is the Lord and he's doing things the righteous way and the perfect way in which we can't understand on this side of eternity. But when we get over on the other side, uh, all will be revealed and we will understand. So in the meantime, let us trust him. If you need to come to the Lord demonstrating that trust today, won't you come right now while together we stand and sing.